Good morning. Again, let me know if the audio is okay or let me know if the audio fails. My name is Susan Shanian. I guess this is the second lecture that I've done for this class. I'm the sheep and goat specialist for the University of Maryland. My office is in Keatesville, which is just south of Hagerstown at the Western Maryland Research and Education Center. It's an approximately 500 acre research farm. We do small ruminants at the research farm, specifically meat goats will be coming in early June and stay through the end of September for what we call a performance test. Today's presentation is on marketing, very different than what you've been doing in the class in terms of taking care of the ewes and their lambs, but ultimately the reason that we keep sheep is for the products that we can get from them. On the top of this slide and also the last slide, I have the URL for the presentation. It's been uploaded to SlideShare. You can view it at SlideShare. If you register with SlideShare, which registration is free, you can download the presentation. All of the, a lot of the PowerPoints that I do for my presentation, a lot of the PowerPoints that I do for meetings and conferences, I upload to SlideShare so that everybody can then have access to them. One of the neat things about sheep and goats as well is that they produce a lot of different products. They're a very versatile animal. People may think about them for one reason or another in terms of why we raise them, but there can be many different reasons that people raise sheep. They can focus on one product or another, or very often they're a multi-purpose animal from which we get one or two, maybe even three products. So I'm going to go into each of these five areas in terms of marketing. All of this occurs in the state of Maryland, uh, occurs nationally. Different enterprises, again, may emphasize different aspects of sheep production. But by far the most important product that we get from sheep the primary reason we raise them, and the majority of the income comes from meat. This hasn't always been true. Uh, historically, once man started selecting sheep for wool, that was the primary product. And up until probably the early 1900s, wool was the dominant product. But now it's by far lamb or meat. And this isn't just true in the United States, but it's true internationally. Even some of the countries that you associate primarily with wool, like Australia, uh, are gradually moving towards more towards meat-type sheep. Not abandoning wool production by any means, but striving to produce better quality meat animals. We get, of course, the meat from a young sheep, less than one year of age, is lamb. And that's the product that we traditionally market. We can tell how old a lamb or sheep is by looking at their teeth. So if you take an animal to a market as a live animal, uh, they can look at their teeth to confirm the age and, and which category they should be sold under. Once the animal is a carcass, meat, hanging on a rail, we can actually tell by a joint on the leg. It's called a, a break or spool joint. If that joint breaks, that's an older animal. If, it's a, if it doesn't break and it's basically cartilage, that's a younger animal. We market lambs at all different sizes, particularly in this part of the country. If we look at the United States as a whole, the average lamb that goes to market is about 135 pounds. That's a pretty big lamb, the biggest in the world in terms of uh, the marketplace. In this part of the country where we're driven a lot by the ethnic markets or non-traditional markets, we tend to market a much lighter weight, leaner lamb. Because that 135 pound lamb is also tends to have more fat on it. So we market a lot of lambs that are less than 100 pounds. We still market 100 pound lambs and lambs over 100 pounds, but we also market a lot more lightweight lambs. In particular, this time of the year, there's a demand for what we call a hothouse lamb. 
And that term hothouse kind of goes back to the idea of a greenhouse and, and raising sheep in a certain way. The hothouse lamb is for Easter, Orthodox Easter. People like Greeks and Italians, uh, very often that lamb is actually even on the light end of that 35 to 50 pounds, actually a lamb that can fit in the oven. Uh, but they'll often eat this, uh, this small young lamb, again, for, for Easter this time of the year. Also for Christmas, you, you also have a demand for this time. This is a very specialized market, and those lambs sell for a very high price per pound. So most of the sheep that are marketed are lambs, and, and this is what brings the most money, and this is primarily uh, what we're after. A sheep that's over a year of age but under a year of age is, is a yearling. Of course, the meat from sheep over a year of age is called mutton. That meat is, has a stronger flavor than lamb, is not traditionally eaten by the average American. Uh, certainly different ethnic groups will eat mutton. Traditionally, a lot of the mutton or, or old sheep are exported uh, to Mexico. So again, the, the big difference between lamb and mutton is the flavor. Lamb has a very strong flavor. Hopefully some of you have had a chance to taste lamb. Hopefully you like it. I know myself, I, I like it, but some people who don't want meat that has as strong a flavor don't like it as well. Lamb, or all meat gets its flavor from fat. So the fatter a muttony sh uh, sheep is, the stronger that flavor is going to be. Now in the United States, we don't eat a lot of lamb compared to, say, poultry meat or beef or pork. The per capita consumption is less than one pound per year. It was higher at one time up around the Second World War and it has declined ever since. It's never been to the same extent as beef and pork and chicken, but it's lower than it's ever been. But what's important to understand about lamb consumption is it's low among the average American and a lot of people have never even had lamb but it's significantly higher among certain ethnic populations. And by ethnic population, I just mean a group of people that share something in common, a, a culture, a language, a nationality. They share something like that in common. And lamb is very popular among, again, people of certain ethnic backgrounds, uh, Hispanic people, that's a very large, diverse group when we use that term. Muslims, there's a very strong link between lamb and religion. It's the preferred meat for all three major religions. Greek and Italian, those are just a few of the groups in which lamb is a favored uh, meat. And then as we look at population demographics in the U.S. and immigration patterns, we can make a case for the demand for lamb increasing as people come from parts of the world in which they are accustomed to eating lamb. Are we ever going to eat as much lamb as beef and pork and chicken? No, no, we're not going to. But the industry is very small, and any small increases in lamb consumption are certainly going to help the industry. Even though a lot of lamb is not consumed in the U.S., the industry, again, is very small, and it cannot meet the domestic demand for lamb. So a very significant part of the market is imported product. And primarily that product comes from Australia and New Zealand, in particular New Zealand. New Zealand produces a, a very good product that's very well received in this country. When you talk about lamb marketing, it's very important to understand the meat inspection that we have in this country and the choices that producers have uh, in terms of marketing because this is determines what they can do, what, how they market. And there's basically four levels of meat inspection. Meat is a very, very inspected product in this country. You just can't, you know, kill a lamb and, and sell lamb chops out your back door. Meat's very inspected. The highest level inspection is federal inspection or, or USDA. The animal is inspected before slaughter and after slaughter. The facilities have to meet, obviously, certain 
many regulations. Uh, the plant has a HACCP plan, hazardous area critical control point. Each point where there's a potential possibility of contamination is what that stands for, but they have to have a HACCP plan in place. If a producer has their lambs processed at a USDA plant and they apply for a label and label their meat, they can sell meat. This is the only way they can actually sell meat. Otherwise, they're selling a live animal. State inspection is another level of inspection that's usually equivalent to federal inspection, but sales in the past have been limited to that state. We don't have that in Maryland. They got rid of that about 20 years ago with budget cuts. So our regulations are federal regulations. Whatever the federal regulations are, that's what our producers have to abide by. Another level of inspection is what we call custom exempt. You can think of this as a local shop maybe that cuts deer. This type of slaughter is exempt from state or federal inspection. In other words, the animal is not inspected before and after slaughter. That's the responsibility of the owner. However, the facilities are inspected and the facilities have to meet certain standards. Under custom exempt slaughter, the animal is simply processed for the owner. The meat is stamped not for resale. So I could have a, a lamb that I produce on my farm. I could have it processed, custom exempt, and put in my freezer. I could also sell a live lamb to a customer. I could deliver that live lamb to the custom exempt plant, and they could process that lamb for my customer. At the time it's processed, it's owned by the customer. The final level of inspection is on-farm, basically on-farm slaughter. Again, this is exempt from state or federal inspection. There's an exemption under federal regulations. In this case, the animal is processed by the owner. Again, I could slaughter a lamb for my own purposes, slaughter the lamb, cut it up, put it in my freezer. I can also sell a lamb to a customer, and that customer can also process that lamb. That meat cannot be resold. It can't be put through a restaurant. It's only for your own use. Another important aspect of marketing lambs in a state like Maryland is we have different types of slaughter. Again, religion has a very strong link to the market for lamb, particularly, again, among Muslims, but also among Jewish people. In order for a Muslim to eat food, but meat in particular, it has to meet halal standards. For Jewish people, it has to meet kosher standards. And these are simply standards that have been developed by those religions, and the slaughter has to meet those requirements. The biggest difference between what I call religious slaughter and, say, your typical slaughter in a, in a regular plant is that the animal is not stunned prior to slaughter. That's the primary difference. There's obviously other differences, but that's the primary one. When you're talking about marketing, and it really doesn't matter whether you're marketing lambs or wool or vegetables or corn, there's two primary marketing options. And, we, and people could use different terms for these. There's what you call commodity marketing. We use the word commodity things like corn and soybeans come to mind in, in the agricultural sector. With commodity marketing, you are selling an undifferentiated product. Uh, this group of lambs would be no different than another group of lambs from another producer. They would not be identified as your lambs. The meat from these lambs would not be identified as yours. That's one aspect of commodity marketing. Another aspect of commodity marketing is that you're selling a raw material. Again, I use corn as an example. Corn goes into so many different products. Well, if you're selling a lamb, the raw product is obviously first the live animal, but also the carcass. And eventually, that live animal then becomes a carcass, and then that carcass is broken down into further cuts. So from, from that standpoint, it's a raw material versus you selling meat. Direct marketing is when we're selling basically the end product to the consumer, directly to the consumer, or almost directly to the consumer, 
or to the end user. There's some examples of direct marketing where there's actually another person involved, like if you sell to a restaurant, the consumer is uh, you're still one link away from the consumer, but I would still consider that direct marketing. Within direct marketing, we have some very specific markets, what we might call a niche or specialty market. And that's when we're kind of targeting a very specific need of the marketplace or we're exploiting a very specific desire for consumers. And we'll talk a little bit about those options because things like that really come into play in a state like Maryland. A couple years ago, the American Sheep Industry Association, which is our commodity association, commissioned a study to look at the lamb market. Where were all the lambs going? How are they being marketed? And so we have statistics on the lamb crop, the number of lambs that are born. We have statistics on federally inspected or USDA slaughter. We have statistics on state inspected slaughter. And what they found when they did this study is they were missing lambs, quite a few lambs. They couldn't figure out where they were going. There was a statistical difference. So they came up with basically this schematic uh, estimating where the lambs are going. So about out of 3.6 million head of lambs, and again, keep in mind the sheep industry is very small. The goat industry is even smaller. If you were to compare these numbers to hogs and cattle, it would be quite significant. But about 2.5 million of those 3.6 million head are slaughtered in federally inspected plants. 2 million of those go into the traditional market sector, which we would call the commodity lamb. That big lamb, that lamb that goes into a lot of the grocery stores, that goes into the um, hotel restaurant trade. But about 500,000 of those lambs that are killed under federal inspection go to the ethnic market which typically means, again, a smaller, leaner lamb. The discrepancy was in the 1.3 million head that they couldn't figure out where they went. So they labeled this the non-traditional market. And some of these go to the sale barn, as you see here, about 300,000 head. But a million, a million lambs go direct to consumers. So direct marketing is a very large aspect of the lamb market, much more important than it is to say pigs, chickens, and cattle. It's a very significant part of the market. I don't know how well you can see this slide, but these are the market reports from this week. San Angelo, Texas on the left, which we would identify as a commodity market. San Angelo, Texas is probably the, the largest sheep production area in the United States. Production is more traditional. The breeds are more traditional. On the right-hand side, and it's even labeled non-traditional, is a market report from New Holland, Pennsylvania, in northeast Pennsylvania. Again, I don't know how well you can read these, but there's a significant price difference between the lambs in the commodity market versus the lambs in the non-traditional market. And the non-traditional market, primarily in this part of the country, or at a sale bar, means the ethnic market. They're going into, uh, they're being sold to slaughterhouses, the kosher and halal slaughterhouses. They're going into live markets in New York City. So they're specifically serving the ethnic markets. But again, there's a significant difference in the uh, prices of these lambs, a little bit of difference in how the lamb prices are reported. One thing I will note is that right now the market prices for lamb and for ewes is the highest it's ever been that I know of. Lamb prices are exceptionally high. Just to give you an example, a 100-pound lamb that's taken to uh, New Holland could be worth almost $250. The condition that lambs have on them, the fat, the muscling, is going to have an impact on their grade. It's going to have an impact on their price. Lambs that can have more flesh, are going to bring more money. Ewes that are kind of in the middle, not too thin and not overly fat, are going to bring the most money. Okay, I want to go through the marketing options for lamb, starting with the commodity market. And as you can see, there's a lot of different choices that producers have or may have even within the commodity market. 
The most common method the market lands is simply to take them to a public auction, what we call a sale barn or stockyards. In Maryland, we have these in Hagerstown, Westminster, Grantsville. We don't have nearly as many as we used to. Many, of course, will go over the line into Pennsylvania. I use a market in Greencastle, Pennsylvania. There's markets in Virginia. There's what we call local markets, the one that's close by. Those lambs will probably be bought and transported to the larger markets. New Holland is what we call a terminal market because most of the lambs that are bought there will go directly to slaughter. Another option that producers have, and this is one that I use, is to sell to some sort of middleman. That could be a feeder. For example, I have a gentleman who buys my lambs at weaning and then continues to graze them before he takes them to slaughter. Some producers need more lambs for their marketing program, so that's another option. There's brokers and order buyers out there who buy for the slaughterhouses and, and things like that, so those are some other options. Sometimes people organize pools where they bring lots of lambs together to share transportation costs. Sometimes there's cooperatives. There's not one in Maryland, but there's a really good one down in southwest Virginia. Another option for commodity lambs is selling directly to the processor, also called an abattoir or a packer. This is a, a kind of a higher form of, of commodity marketing because you do have some identity with the lambs that you sell. And you may be able to be paid based on the quality of those lambs. Marketing options switching to the direct market, which is very common in a state like Maryland. It's common for a couple of reasons. One, our production costs are very high, so we tend to need higher prices in order to make a profit. And secondly, we've got a, a population that, that uh, in a situation that's ideal for selling uh, directly to consumers. When we direct market, we may direct market a live animal or we may direct market the meat. In a live animal, one of the ways we direct market it, and very common in Maryland, is what I call the freezer or locker trade. I sell a lamb to a customer. I deliver the lamb to the slaughterhouse, custom exempt USDA slaughterhouse, and they pick up their meat. Another live animal direct marketing option is on-farm slaughter. Again, I sell a live animal to my customer. They do the processing for themselves. This is primarily to the ethnic market. Most people would consider the highest form of direct marketing to sell the meat either the whole or part of the carcass, or specifically different retail cuts. Again, you have to be labeled in order to sell meat. You have to be inspected in a federal plant, and you have to be labeled. So to get that meat directly to the consumer, it could be a direct sale. Uh, you could have a farm store. You could take it to the farmer's market. You could market through the internet. You could market through a restaurant. Again, this is the one that has an extra link. I'm having my meat or my animals custom processed at a USDA inspected plant. The meat is labeled. I'm selling to the restaurant who then sells to the consumer, but I'm still selling a retail product. Same thing with the retail store. Is I'm selling the meat and they're selling to the customer, but I'm still selling retail and not wholesale. Obviously the potential for additional income is higher in direct marketing, but the thing you always have to remember is there's costs associated with different marketing options. And so producers got to figure out what's the most profitable for them. The niche markets, and again, this is just filling a specific need. There's lots of them out there. People have a lot of perceptions of what they think is good or what they want in terms of the food that they eat. Some examples of these niche markets are grass-fed, organic, naturally raised, grain-fed, milk-fed. There's various organizations that will certify the care of how, or how those animals were raised. And there's also a certified fresh American lamb program, similar, but obviously not nearly as popular as the certified Angus beef program. Uh, so there, a niche is anything you can exploit, anything you can find that, that will you serve a specific need of your customer. When those markets get bigger, then they become not so much a niche market, but they slip into the commodity marketing. One of the concerns that a lot of small producers have is the commercialization of some of these, quote, niche markets, grass-fed, organic, uh, et cetera. There is a checkoff. What that means is every lamb or sheep that's sold, there's an assessment. It's a half a cent per pound of lamb, 30 cents per carcass, basically. That assessment funds the activities of the American Lamb Board, which is basically the organization that promotes American lamb. 
Okay, let's switch to the next product, which is wool and skins. Again, traditionally, 100, 150 years ago, this was primarily the reason sheep were raised. Okay, everybody knows that the, basically the hair of sheep is called wool. The sheep at College Park are hair sheep. They have wool mixed in with their fleeces, but that hair makes that fleece undesirable, unmarketed, unmarketable. And of course, they shed. Most sheep do produce wool. Uh, the majority of sheep produce wool. Usually those sheep are sheared once a year, usually in the spring before the onset of hot weather, or ideally before lambing. Fleece weight varies per sheep, probably anywhere from a couple of pounds to more than 20 pounds. But in the U.S., on average, a fleece weighs about 8 pounds or just shy of 8 pounds. The wool varies tremendously in terms of length and more specifically in terms of fiber diameter or fineness from less than 18 microns to more than 40 microns, so tremendous variability. And that fiber diameter determines what that wool is used for. The finer it is, the more versatile it, it is in terms of its use, the more valuable it is in the marketplace. Kind of an offshoot of wool are pelts or skins. And of course, a pelt or skin is simply the skin of the animal with the wool or the hair or the fur still attached to it. It's an important byproduct of the sheep industry and really of all livestock industries. Just a little bit more valuable with sheep because of the wool being attached to the skin. Much like meat, there are marketing options on the commodity level as well as direct marketing. From a commodity level, again, an undifferentiated product, a raw product. Uh, a producer can sell it to the shearer. Give it to the shearer. Trade the shearer for their services. Take it to a wool pool. A wool pool is where everybody brings their wool to the same place. Wool warehouse. Uh, we don't have any in Maryland, but there's one in Ohio that people will sometimes use. Fiber co-ops. More and more of these are, are, are cropping up where people can uh, try to pull their, their fiber and, and create some markets for it. Selling directly to a woolen mill. Again, we don't have any in Maryland but there certainly are examples not far from Maryland. And there is even a limited export market. Speaking of the commodity market, Maryland has a wool pool. It's every June. It's over 40 years old. It very successfully markets wool. It, it's kind of a marketing, uh, a very good model for marketing agricultural products. The wool is brought to the pool. It's sorted in the grades, it's packaged into these large wool bales. It's sold sealed bid actually prior to the wool being delivered. There's a minimal deduction of five to eight cents per pound for handling and marketing. Maryland Sheep Breeders Association runs the wool pool and they do deduct membership fees. Prices last year were 37 to 55 cents a pound. Not a lot of money for this product. Prices are higher this year, but again, it's not a very viable product in terms of a com at the commodity level, not in this part of the country, not with the type of wool we grow. Each year our pool gets smaller. I remember when we handled over 100,000 pounds and we picked, it up, picked up wool for two and a half days. We have one day and uh, probably less than 25,000 pounds of wool now. There is a government program for wool and this relates primarily to the commodity marketing. It's very similar to what you can get for the grains, corn and soybeans. It's basically a price support. You have to own the wool before you apply for this. Right now, prices are high enough that basically this program isn't kicking in. On the right, you can see basically what the support prices are for wool. And um, they're not really very high, but in recent years, prices have been below those support levels. There's also support level for mohair. Mohair is a much more valuable fiber than wool. Mohair comes from Angora goats. Where the place to make money in wool marketing is by selling direct. And direct can take a lot of different forms. The most common is simply to sell your fleeces to hand spinners or weavers or people who make crafts. Compared to taking the wool to the wool pool, you need to keep your sheep cleaner. You need to keep the fleeces cleaner. You need to make sure you have a good shearer. You need to skirt the fleece. And skirting a fleece simply means taking the bad parts out. You could go the next step and do some sort of processing to that wool before you sell it. It could be simply scouring and cleaning the wool and selling clean wool. 
we have a new small mill in Frederick County, I believe, that'll make it into roving. Uh, just kind of next step up just from a clean raw fleece. You can send it to various mills to have it made into yarn. Go one step further and make a finished product. Blankets. The picture on the right is from a company or a mill in Prince Edward Island that makes blankets. A lot of people use that mill. I visited there last year. Lots of different types of clothing, obviously, uh, hats, mittens, scarves, sweaters, all sorts of things, different bedding materials, different specialty products, a lot of like knick-knack type things that people will make out of wool. In terms of niche markets, I tried to think of what are a few niche markets out there. Organic is probably one of them. Specific breeds, specific types of wool can be obviously be a niche market. An important aspect of direct marketing with wool, of course, is the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival. That'll come up in just a couple of weeks at the Howard County Fairgrounds. It's always the first full weekend in May. There's a large fleece show and sale there. There's wool sheep shows, vendors, craft booths, all sorts of different activities that help people direct market wool and the products that we make from wool. Wool is kind of a really neat commodity or product, e even though it's not as economically significant as it used to be. They're really coming up with some innovative uses for it. Of course, it's been known for a number of years for its ability to soak up chemical spills, such as oil spills. Some new things that you may not have heard about is we use it for packaging material. There's a lady in the UK who's been using it to package temperature sensitive items. It's a good insulation. It's being made into bricks. It's used as mulch. It's used as diaper covers. Kind of the newest one in the news has been coffins, making coffins out of wool. And we're basically talking about felted wool. And then they're using nanotechnology to make some really specific things out of the wool proteins. It's pretty exciting some of the things they're doing with wool. And hopefully it can increase the value of wool for producers as these things are developed. As I mentioned, pelts or skins are an aspect of the, of the sheep industry. Uh, again, there's two levels, commodity and direct. For a plant that's large enough, the pelts are a very valuable byproduct. You can see the prices. This is a market report from this week. You have prices as high as $22 a pelt. So they can be a very significant byproduct. And the value of the animal or carcass is supposed to be figured into those pelts. Lambs that have better pelts will bring better prices. For a small processor, they're a waste product. They don't have enough of them to market, so it's something they have to get rid of. And it's certainly it's a product that producers can direct market. Many producers will have their own pelts tanned, and they will market them for $90, $100, over $100. So there is some opportunity for direct marketing. Actually, pelts and leather, the leather made from it is probably an untapped, it's not an untapped market for the, for commercial industry, but maybe for producers to get a larger share of the value of pelts. Sheep dairy products, we've only got one sheep dairy in Maryland. It's a very small part of a very small industry. We basically have three ways to market sheep dairy products. It might be more applicable to talk about goat dairy products, but you have grade A, which is basically milk. You have grade B, which is milk for manufacturing. And then you have non-inspected, where you could sell soap or lotion made from milk. What a producer would be able to do in terms of marketing dairy products is going to be determined to a large extent by the regulatory system. Milk is the most regulated and inspected food that we have. It's enforced by the State Department of Health or Department of Agriculture, the Milk Sanitation Division. Regulations vary, but are generally the same as cow dairies. The difference between grade A and B, grade B dairies, don't tend to have as stringent regulations. But everything to do with producing and harvesting and handling that milk is determined in those regulations. So the marketing options, if I had a sheep dairy or a goat dairy, would be the commodity level where I'm basically selling milk, which really isn't an option necessarily in Maryland unless you do the third part. Selling milk would be somebody would pick it up or I would take it to a, a, a processor. The advantage with sheep milk, as you see in this picture, you can actually freeze it and ship it on pallets to a more distant processor. What's going to be more common in a state like Maryland is direct marketing, where you're either going to process your own products or you're going to 
say ship your milk to a cheese plant and they're gonna and they're gonna get the cheese back. And when you have your own products to sell, it's very similar to meat in terms of your outlets. You may have a farm store, you may take it to a farmer's market, you may sell it across the internet, you may sell it through restaurants or retail stores. So it's gonna be very similar to marketing meat. A new aspect of marketing uh, sheep and goat products isn't so much a product as a service. Increasingly, sheep and goats are being recognized for their environmental contributions, their ability to graze and to eat things that we don't want. And to have them graze instead of using mechanical methods or using chemical methods. And so this is a potential business for producers, what I call fee-based grazing. As far as I know, we only have one business in Maryland right now, and it's with goats. And you can see their website right there and their URL. So they will, somebody will have a need for them, there'll be a job site, and they'll work out what the cost is going to be. This, is, this has a lot of potential, but it's only developing. It's much more common in the West, particularly with large flocks of sheep, a lot of work being done with noxious weeds, things like that. Uh, a lot of, I think there's going to be a lot more opportunity in this area in the future. But it's still kind of at its at its infancy in terms of a potential economic part of sheep and goat production. The last product and the primary reason I mention this one is because this does occur in Maryland, probably more so than in some other states because of our location, our location to NIH and to, to things in Washington, D.C. Sheep are a very common research model. People do sell sheep to be used in research. We do have a farm in Maryland that has, raises animals so that there can be practice, surgical practice. The largest sheep farm in Maryland uh, harvests blood from the sheep. They have a large flock of weathers, and they, and they bleed them every so often. It's actually a pretty neat operation in terms of if you're a sheep, it's, 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 you might think, well, that doesn't sound like a very good system for the sheep, but uh, all they do is bleed and eat, and they get big and fat. They have a pretty good life. They stay in the system as, as long as they're healthy. Don't know if we have any situations in Maryland, but increasingly animals like sheep are being raised for the protein in their milk. I often tell classes that if you ever bit, get bit by a rattlesnake, the venom has actually been made in sheep. Not in this country, but they are. it is made in sheep. And then there's various government contracts in which uh, animals are needed for certain, certain aspects. Almost all of these opportunities obviously are going to be contractual and are going to be between the, the producer and the company or government agency that needs them. They have certainly more potential for, for profit, or I should say income, but there's obviously a lot of higher costs associated with, with doing some of these things because the... Uh, health requirements are going to be incredibly high. I was at a farm in Kentucky last year where they were they had a group of uh, basically yearling ewes that were going to be going to a hospital and or hospital type research where they were doing artificial lung research with them. So this is another aspect but a relatively small aspect of the industry. And with that I will uh, finish. Again, the URL for this presentation is listed on this slide. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I think the main point to understand is that we do get a lot of products out of sheep, and we have a lot of different ways we can market them. In most people, they don't tend to market in any one way. For example, my lambs, I will market in several different ways. I will direct market some, but I will also usually take at least a few to a sale barn. So I'll go from the direct marketing to the commodity marketing. And it will vary sometimes in years. Prices are so high right now with lambs that actually simply taking them to the sale barn or simply marketing them at the commodity level is pretty profitable. When prices aren't as high, direct marketing becomes more favorable. Wool prices haven't been high for a long time, so for someone to make money on 
rule in Maryland, they need to be in the direct or knit market area. Most of the people that have wool on meat sheep, it's basically a, a, a byproduct that costs more to, to market than the value that it has. It's one of the reasons why hair sheep have increased in popularity is because there's no money in wool unless you knit to direct market it. And to do that, you need to raise specific types of wool, and you need to do a good job with it in terms of keeping it clean. And that can be a challenge for a lot of producers. The wool that comes into the wool pool is pretty dirty and not near the quality that it would need to be for hand spinning or further processing. But there's a lot of interest in wool, and there always has been. And, and I think as a result, you'll, we will continue to see efforts to try to direct market it and, and to make this product have value in the marketplace. The dairy sheep side, again, is very small, and, and it's exciting that we have our first dairy sheep farm in Maryland. We're going to be having a dairy conference in October to try to promote and look at the uh, small ruminant and dairy sector, because in the end, that probably has the most economic potential because you have multiple products to market. And in particular, sheep milk is the uh, very high quality in terms of they don't produce as much as a goat, but you can make twice as much cheese from it. And the lambs are more valuable in that enterprise than the kid goats are in the dairy goat enterprise. In fact, the kid goats in the dairy goat enterprise are almost like wool on meat sheep. They, they cost more to get rid of and to market than the value that they have. Actually, they cost more to raise to a marketable size than you're going to get out of them. Questions? I believe your class ends at 10 to 9, so I think it's pretty good timing. No questions. Everybody's eyes glazed over, not awake yet. We often tell people that this is the most important part of, of any agricultural enterprise and that you start with marketing and go backwards. The sheep dairy, I believe, is in Baltimore or Baltimore County or, or somewhere up in there. I actually haven't visited yet. Interestingly enough, next Wednesday, there's a tour of a sheep dairy in New Jersey that's been organized by a uh, Maryland producer whose daughter works there. They milk 600 ewes, and they have the farm set up for agro-tourism. Even with goats, we only have a few certified dairies, and they're all grade B. They go into cheese manufacturing. For some reason, we don't get, we don't have a lot of interest in the dairies. The dairy in New Jersey, I know they make, obviously all of them make cheeses. I think this one actually makes yogurt. They call it yogurt. One of the problems with the sheep dairy side is we are very limited genetically. We've only got two breeds of dairy sheep and one of them's not readily available and we're in dire need of new genetics. I contrast that with the dairy goat industry and we that's a, a strength actually of our goat industry is we've got a lot of good dairy goats. Myself, I'm planning on bringing a dairy ram in this fall to cross onto my composites. Not so much that I want to milk sheep but to improve the milk production. Yes, there's a concentration of some sheep dairies up in New England. Most of the sheep dairy industry is either in New England or in Wisconsin. Uh, the largest or most well-known sheep dairy is called Chatham, and it's in New York. Every year there's a North American Dairy Sheep Con Conference. 
but the dairy sheep industry stays small and doesn't really grow. So what that would tell you is that it's a tough business, that it's a tough business. And of course, all of agriculture nowadays is a tough business. We may have high land prices, but we also have incredibly high feed costs. So everything's gone up. Even $7 a bushel corn may sound good, but again, every cost that those producers have has gone up. So the name of the game really in all of agriculture, but it, it, definitely in sheep, is efficiency. The picture you see here that in order to make money in the sheep business, we need two lambs. You with one lamb is not getting the job done. You need two quality lambs to be able to market. And on the wool side, we need good quality, clean fleeces that can be direct marketed, uh, two hand spinners. I may only get 50 cents a pound, 75 cents a pound of wool at the wool pool, but if I sell the hand spinners, I can get $10 a pound. So this is significant uh, opportunity in direct marketing. There's a lot more profit potential in direct marketing wool, really, when you think about it, than there is lamb. You can only push lamb prices up so much, and you can't really push them up at all right now. And then there's high processing costs. Well, wool, you can really push the price. You know, I can go from 75 cents a pound to $10 a pound, so I can really push the price up. You're welcome, and everybody have a, have a great day.